We turn now to the new developments in the deadly police shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. in North Carolina. The family attorney has shared new video of deputies going to the scene and the results of an independent autopsy report. And yet, calls for the transparency continue to grow. ABC's Victor Akendo has the latest. Tonight, new street camera video showing deputies rushing to Andrew Brown Jr.'s home, tweeted by his family's lawyers. Deputies piled into the back of a pickup truck, turning the corner and jumping out. Brown's house is out of sight. Moments later, he was shot and killed. Today, lawyers and Brown's family revealing the results of an independent autopsy. It was a kill shot to the back of the head. According to their autopsy report, Brown was shot five times. He had four gunshot wounds to his right arm and one to his head. Attorneys for the family saying that Brown was struck in the arm as his hands were on the steering wheel and was fleeing the gunfire when he was shot in the back of the head. So it went into the base of the neck, in the bottom of the brain, the skull, and got lodged in his brain. The state releasing Brown's death certificate stating he died within minutes of a penetrating gunshot wound of the head. It's been nearly a week since Brown was killed. Each day, seeing peaceful protest and continued calls to publicly release body camera videos from the incident. Andrew Brown! The Pasquotank County attorney filing a motion Monday, petitioning for all videos to be released. A court hearing is now set for tomorrow morning. We sat down with Andrew's son, Khalil, the only family member to watch a redacted portion of the body camera video. What has this been like for your family? We all need answers and we just can't get it. It's stressing us out a lot. You know, we haven't been eating, sleeping like we're supposed to. It's just eating us up. The family just so distraught by this. We're joined now by Victor Kendo in North Carolina. And this case really seems to be widening at this point with the state's governor now weighing in, the FBI also opening an investigation. Lindsay, the FBI opening a federal civil rights investigation into the shooting. North Carolina's governor calling for a special prosecutor in this case. And tonight, for the first time since the shooting, there is a curfew in effect here in Elizabeth City until further notice. Lindsay? And you talk about that curfew. What have you heard in the community about that? Well, protesters have been out every single night for almost a week now. We should mention everything has been peaceful here. But tonight, Compared to last night when we saw hundreds of people on the streets, I can tell you that here in the downtown area, it's pretty much cleared out. Lindsay? Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. For the latest on negotiations over policing reform in Washington, let's bring in Democratic Congresswoman Karen Bass of California, the former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Congresswoman. Thanks for having me on. So you, of course, led the House effort to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in March, but as you know, it did not receive any Republican support. And Senate Republicans have called the House bill partisan. Now you're a leading House member on negotiations on a bill with the Senate. Where do those talks stand right now as far as getting the bipartisan support it needs to move forward? Well, first of all, after we passed the bill on March 3rd, uh, we began conversations immediately with the Problem Solvers Caucus in the House, and that's a bipartisan group. And we were making recommendations to the um, to the Senate. And those, ta those talks and discussions and meetings were informal, but we're now ready to move into formal negotiations. And the difference is, is that when you're talking informally, you don't necessarily have the approval or the authority from the leadership. So the leadership is in uh, the process now of uh, formalizing their appointments and their approval for us to begin bipartisan talks. So I'm very hopeful. I think we have an 80 to 90 percent chance of having the bill on the president's desk within the next few weeks. Certainly by the time of May 25th, which is the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. In thinking about the past week, just the shootings that have happened uh, by police then with uh, Makai Bryant, Andrew Brown, Isaiah Brown, if we look at, say, getting rid of chokeholds or getting rid of no-knock warrants, uh, neither of those would have saved those lives. What in the bill uh, would actually change what we see happening right now? Well, one of the most important sections of the bill has to deal with accountability. You know, um, when Derek Chauvin was torturing and murdering uh, George Floyd, he was looking at the camera because he felt he could act with impunity. He wasn't worried about being sued and he wasn't worried about being prosecuted. Thank goodness 
that youngster was filming it because the report that he filed said that George Floyd died of a medical incident and as though he had nothing to do with it at all. And so our bill would have addressed, number one, his civic, his civil liability, as well as uh, the ability to prosecute him. Uh, the Also, the bill has lots of provisions in it, some call for training. The other key piece to the bill that would have made a difference in this instance is those three officers, two who were also leaning on George Floyd and one who was standing by, they would have been uh, culpable because our bill says that there is a duty to intervene. If one of your partners is doing something that's corrupt or violent, excessive, you have a duty to intervene and to stop. You might recall in one tape, the officer did try to get Derek Chauvin to turn George Floyd over so he wouldn't be prone. And Derek basically said no. In this instance, he would have been required to intervene. He could have turned him over. He chose not to, but to obey Derek Shaw. And you brought this up in the beginning of your answer. Kind of want to uh, probe this a little bit more. The issue of qualified immunity for individual police officers, which protects them against lawsuits, as you stated. And that sounds like has been a core sticking point in the negotiation. Senator Tim Scott has suggested instead that maybe you allow legal action against police departments instead of individual officers. What's your bottom line on what has to happen on the issue of qualified immunity? Well, we are examining all options. The main point is to hold officers accountable. Now, of course, you know, I'm not going to negotiate publicly, but uh, the accountability piece of it is what is most important. And, and since the outcome in the Derek Chauvin trial, we've seen near daily instances of black Americans either being shot or losing their lives in altercations, uh, interactions with police. Are you concerned that the measures in this bill aren't enough to address the systemic issues and how police handle interactions with black and brown Americans? I know you, you mentioned the accountability, but right. does it go beyond that? Well, absolutely. Uh, again, the bill is quite extensive. There's very strong measures on accreditation and training. And then we want to raise questions to the quality of the training. But your overall question is, will this bill solve the problem? Absolutely not. The problem is much deeper, much bigger than any one bill can do. And so we are looking at new measures to add to this bill. So, for example, one of the many uh, instances when officers get involved in violent encounters with members of the public is people who are suffering from mental illness. Now, police officers aren't equipped to handle that, nor should they be. We have basically cut funding to cities and states so much that when there are problems, we expect the police officers to pick up the pieces. This isn't right to them, and it is certainly not right to the general public. So why don't we provide appropriate mental health care so people don't deteriorate into a crisis where they become violent? You know, why do we have just police officers respond? Why don't we have social workers? If it's a child welfare situation where a social worker is going to remove a child from a home, she might or he might go with a police officer. Maybe we can have teams that go out instead of individual officers. We need to stop relying on police to solve health, social, and economic issues. It's not fair to the general public, and it is certainly not fair to the officers. Lastly, President Biden makes his joint address to Congress tomorrow night. Beyond policing reform, what would you say is the most important message or issue that you're looking for him to address to both Congress as well as the American people? Well, you know, when he talks about building back better, I'm looking to see how his infrastructure bill will address some of the issues I just made reference to. You know, over the years, because we have denigrated and demonized government, we've cut government in ways that we shouldn't have. And I know that he views infrastructure as much beyond bricks and mortar, but actually looking at the human infrastructure. And, and so I'm going to be very interested into how he talks about that. And of course, the progress that has been made on COVID and the economy. Congresswoman Karen Bass, we so appreciate your time and insight. Thanks for having me. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.